Say once again, here we go. Sing it with me. It's the forward partition coordinate song. It's the forward to partition coordinate song. Tune and the internet will fix that for me. Sing it with me. It's the forward to Cartesian coordinate song. 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 Hello and good morning. I almost had that timed right. I was gonna, at the end of that song, crossfade into me. My mic is on, hello, hello. I'm trying to be somewhat more professional this morning with my opening Coding Train logo and some music, which instead of me just here like, is the, is the stream starting? Is the stream starting? Oh wait, oh wait, okay, hi. So this was my new attempt. Let me know how it went. Uh, welcome and good morning and well, uh, to the Coding, well, meh. Shoot, I was doing so well. Welcome and good morning. No, it goes like this. Good morning and welcome to the coding train. My name, I'm your host, Daniel Schiefmann. And I am here every Wednesday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern, to do some coding stuff. Um, and actually, I'm really excited about today. Uh, I recently released uh, a few videos about making a GIF. I think, by the way, that these videos are getting tons of views just because people want to know whether how I'm going to pronounce the word GIF. <laughs> it's like, oh, and I feel like, oh, I really, I, that wasn't my best work either, that GIF loop video. I feel like oh, I went on and on and on at the beginning, and then in the end, it's just a rotating square, and I could have done so much better. <laughs> but alas, people seem to be enjoying it and watching it. Um, if you go onto Twitter and go to hashtag uh, GIF, Train, gift train, gift train, because these gifts are little gifts, little hearts out into the world. Uh, if you go to gift, gift train, you can see, I'm just gonna go to latest here. Um, wait a second, I'm a little bit afraid to click on this one. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Uh, but um, you can see that people are sharing uh, gifts that they've made, and uh, I hope to see more of these. Um, this is a pretty interesting one by the uh, composer of the I Will Refactor This Later song. I will Ooh, that's very loud. This later, you know, I will this later. I will um, so please continue to share those. In addition to sharing on Twitter, or I suppose if I ever got around to using Instagram, you could share stuff with me there. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I had this, this whole thing where I was gonna switch over to using Mastodon and somehow I never was able to make that really happen. <laughs> uh, but maybe I'll give that another try. Um, but, oh, no, no, that's, oh, spoiler alert. Okay, uh, I also, you can also share things on the Coding Train website itself. Here are four hearts submissions that I will now share with you. The first one I will share with you is Love Hearts by Anrag Hazra. So I guess I can click and everywhere I click it makes a heart. Oh, look at this. And they're like, oh, oh, it's like it's tracing its contours more and more. This is beautiful. Excellent work. I love it. Uh, let's look at the changing the Cassini oval to a heart by Simon. A different Simon than the usual coding train 
viewer Simon Tiger. Ah, oh, look at that. I love that. Another beating heart. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make more coding challenges with like hearts and stars and rainbows and things like that. That just it brings me such happiness and joy. Okay, that's beautiful work. Uh, rainbow heart. Excellent use of the combining of the rainbow with the heart together. Uh, let's click on this. This is by Riaz Lakar. Laskar. Um, oh, here it comes. It's falling from the sky. Oh, it's coming from the sides. I think this one needs. That is beautiful. I love this. I love the creative use, the way people are using this sort of path of that formula, the heart curve creatively, and having it be the boundaries of the, basically a particle system that's coming in. Really nice work. Uh, and let's look at one more. Heartbeat by Copper France. And here we go. Oh, look at that. That is really cool. So this is, look at this. So you can see the cardioid shape and the particular heart curve there. And you can see it sort of beating back and forth between the two of them. And this also is a wonderful, um, this is a wonderful um, reference uh, to, a wonderful allusion to the uh, circled square shape morphing coding challenge that uh, Golan Levin presented on this channel here. So you can see this is morphing between two shapes, the heart shape and the cardioid shape. It's gonna be sad to move away from hearts today. We're gonna have to keep the heart, we're gonna have to keep the heart thing going. All right, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna try to not have too much um, exposition and just get right to the coding because I'm so excited about this topic that I'm gonna do today. Uh, it, this happened spontaneously as if in a dream to me. <laughs> and yet it, uh, yet it's something that's been around for quite a while that people have been using as a technique. And I, I would say a pioneer of this technique is Etienne J um, Jacob, Etienne Jacob. I don't know how to say the last name in French. Um, and you can see this. I don't know that this was made based on the fact that I did a heart curve coding challenge. <laughs> I can only be, I can, I can be somewhat semi-confident, suspicious that maybe it is somewhat partially and a little bit inspired by my coding challenge simply by the date of February 15th, given that I did the coding challenge on, I think, February 13th. Uh, was my, my live stream last week because today is February 20th. Um, but what I want you to look at this, and I want, what I want you to blow, what I want, what really blows my mind about this, it might not be immediately apparent to you, is this is not a processing sketch, a P5 sketch running. Presumably it might have been created with one of those things, but it is in fact a GIF. Um, there is a little bit of, if, what's amazing about this is there's a lot of randomness and randomness of this, in this GIF. It seems chaotic and random, and yet somehow it loops seamlessly. Although now that I look at it, I see this like slight moment of a jump. <laughs> but we can look more and more at Etienne's Twitter feed. Let's look at this one. Similar idea, but this is a GIF. It is looping over and over again. How, I talked about in my GIF looping challenge, that the end point, of a GIF, the last frame of a GIF, if it matches with the first frame, it will appear seamless. But how do you have something that's so random and chaotic and yet somehow accidentally or by design ends with a frame at the end that matches the one from the beginning? And this is exactly what I will present to you today in a coding challenge about creating a Perlin noise loop. So before I keep going and talk too much about this, um, let me, um, this, so this is another reference. This is, I think, even more salient here. Like this particular, like how in the world is this looping? How is that looping? How is that looping? <laughs> now the answer to this is if you read Etienne's article here all about Perlin noise functions and this particular technique for how to animate noisy stuff with a nice trick. So I, I'm gonna present to you my own way of doing this, which I suspect is exactly what's in there, considering that this, I, th I think I read this article probably in 2017 when it came out, and then somehow yesterday, 
in the middle of a class at ITP here. I was like, oh, I, have, I invented this new idea. And then I was, uh, I, I, I messaged Goal on Levin about it because I was like, oh, I invented this new idea. And he's like, uh-huh, yeah, by the way, this is my P5.js sketch that I made that I sent you like a year ago or six months ago that does exactly that. So clearly I didn't invent that. I just thought that I did. I had remembered something. But I'm going to go through this with you today. And it's, I'm, I'm so excited about it because it's really going to change for, it's, I think it's going to open up a lot of interesting and unique creative possibilities for you. And you can make hearts and rainbows with it. Right? Because that's what you're going to make. Yes. And of course, we're going to need polar to Cartesian coordinate transformations. Ah. I think I did show David Snyder, uh, Snyder's uh, Fourier heart gift, but let me just make sure to give this a nice highlight because this is what I love. Something that I absolutely love the most is when I see different bits of code and examples that I've made get combined and recombined in unique and interesting ways. And here is a nice ode to Valentine's Day with the heart curve and the Fourier transform by um, David Snyder. Hashtag gift train. Okay. Uh, and now, oh no, oh, I wanted to keep that up. Let's put that here. I think I'm going to attempt to do this in the P5 web editor, even though there is a somewhat significant bug that you are all aware of if you've watched my, um, what video did I experience that in? The bouncing DVD logo. Let's make this, is that okay? Too big, too small. I move this over a tiny bit. Move this over. Let's see if I do this. Um, question is, I think I would like this to be a little bit bigger. And if I do wait, 600, 600. Let's put on auto refresh. Let's make that zero. Let's make this. Uh, oh, I know the camera went off. I have a, I'm on a path to fixing this camera issue, don't worry. Everything is going to change for the coding train in the future. Ah, welcome, new member, Cryptic. So by the way, if you like what I do, there's no requirement to do this. I will mention there is an opportunity to join as a YouTube member. I also have a Patreon. I'm not so sure about the Patreon. I'm trying to figure out what to do about that. but. Um, uh, you will get an invite to a Slack channel. I will, at some point, <laughs> in, a, in some amount of time, mail you some stickers, and you will also have my uh, thanks. Um, so thank you to new member. You get a little fancy icon. So I don't know, anybody in the chat who's a member, uh, I'm just curious, I forget what it is, but the, your icon changes, your little emoji icon changes based on how long you've been a member. And I can't remember what I mean. I think the dot, the this dot character is the first one. And I think the rainbow is the last one. Maybe I've had to be a member for two years or something. So I can't imagine, I don't even had it for that long. But I'm curious to see uh, what those, what those, uh, I set them up at one point. All right, so I think, um, um, I think, all right, so is that okay, this font size? Is that visible? Um, and think about, think about the, all of the people around the world who are like on their, on the bus or the subway, on their way to work or school with their little tiny mobile device watching the coding train. Can they read my code? <coughs> All right. Um, so this is going to be a coding challenge. It's going to relate to a lot of different things. So the two things um, that I want to mention are blobby. This it also relates to this, and um, Perlin noise playlist coding train. Mm. Mm. What's going to happen here? Okay, hold on a second. Um, just give me a second here. I want to be logged in as a different person. 
One of these days I'll fix this. Um, it's fine. Just give me a second here, everybody. Uh, Perlin. No. I swear I have a Perlin noise playlist. Ah, there it is. Oh, yeah. Log is by Log. Okay. Uh, there we go. All right. So I don't know. I think I'm going to start with this. What's one of these are amazing, by the way. I mean, look at that. I don't think I should lead with this because this is misleading. I'm never going to create anything so beautiful as Etienne Jacobs. But I think, oh yeah, this, this, this is definitely related to what I want to do. Um, and um, where's the heart? Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right, this I can lead with. I need to make sure I have a whiteboard, working whiteboard. Ooh, this, this, this is no good. I've got three markers here. Uh, David in the Slack channel asks, uh, Dan, do you think you'll ever make a 3D version of Blobby? I've been trying it since I saw the Blobby video and I can't figure it out. Oh. I like this idea. Yes. In fact, we should make a three. I mean, you would need the spherical geometry coding challenge. So the spherical geometry coding challenge combined with the blobby coding challenge is the path to do this. And I would love to do that. That's a great idea. <laughs> okay, wait. Trying to find a marker that will do us justice. No. Aha! I think I have found, this is the marker, which will be the marker for today. How are we doing on glare? Let's see. Uh, that's not causing the glare. Is it this one? That's definitely the glare. That's better. Okay, let's make sure this works. <laughs> oh, that was the saddest thing ever. <laughs> You know, you'd think somebody who has a, co a YouTube channel with like hundreds of thousands of subscribers would bother to find a marker before going live. And yet I can't seem to manage to get myself to do this. Fortunately for me, I have a box here. And this box, you can't see it, is full of markers. So we're going to find one. I need, what I need is another box that's full of markers that are used up. Nope. I can tell already. Okay, promising. Very promising. Ah, there we go. This one will do the job. Polar noise loops. This is the topic for right now. By the way, incidentally, it's also my intention to talk about JavaScript inheritance with uh, prototypes and uh, ES6 classes. So that'll be the, uh, <laughs> that's gonna be the boring stuff that comes later. I mean, I don't know what's boring and what's not boring, but that's gonna come later. Okay, let's make sure this camera has got a half an hour of Possibilities. Uh, I, by the way, I've just decided I'm, I'm not bothering with slow mode anymore with the chat. Uh, somebody in, <laughs> yes, it's the spherical and coordinate polar song. <clears throat> Thank you, K Weekman, for that suggestion. Uh, I have, I, I I haven't remembered in recent weeks to put slow mode on in the chat, and so now I'm kind of leaving it without slow mode in the hopes that the community and my, uh, uh, my continuous presentation of hearts <laughs> will keep the chat under control. 
but uh, please, if it, if it becomes unwieldy or a problem for anyone, um, let me know. In particular, those of you who are in the Patreon YouTube member Slack group, um, you can let me know if you need me to turn on slow mode. Yes, I am calling this Polar Noise Loops. Welcome to the Polar Express. Come on. All right. I don't know if that's a good name for it, but that's what I'm calling it. All right. Let's, let's get this started. Time to do some coding. Hello. Okay, I knew something went wrong. Hold on. Uh, Zani Dalipi in the chat asks, hey, is there a fixed time when he goes live? And in fact, there has never historically been a fixed time, but there is a fixed time now. And that fixed time is right now, every Wednesday, uh, 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. Shoot. My mic clip is kind of broken. Hopefully this is going to hold. I think it's going to be OK. Um, let's try that again. I have tissues, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> I think I better start treating the live streams as actual like time on the internet in video, as opposed to just like, oh, I'm not really, because it's not part of the thing that I'll edit for later, but whatever. Hello, and welcome to a coding challenge. Whew. If you can't tell, I'm really excited about this one. So I found this GIF the other day by Etienne Jacob, um, Etienne Jacob, uh, with my American pronunciation, and look at it, it might look familiar to you. It looks like that heart curve that I made in a coding challenge previously. Now, I can't say for sure whether this GIF was made based on my heart curve coding challenge, but I can say for sure that the work of Etienne is amazing and phenomenal and uses a special technique, one that I have recently rediscovered in a dream. It came to me in a dream, and yet it's been on the internet at least since 2017, if not before that. So what's going on here that's so fabulous and exciting is this chaotic scene, this scene of randomness and smoky heart beauty is actually a perfect GIF loop. How is it that the end matches the beginning? And this is something I talked about in my previous coding challenge, GIF loop, where we looked at, okay, well, we can move something across the window, we can rotate something, and as long as the last frame matches up with the first frame, it will loop. But if it's all random and chaotic, how do you do that? And so um, there is a technique for doing this, um, Golan Levin actually also has an example bit of code which describes this in more detail, which I will show you later in this video. Um, but mostly what I want to do is highlight to you this blog post uh, from Necessary Disorder, Etienne, from November 15th, 2017, which explains this technique of creating GIFs like this. Here's another one! How could this even possibly work? And so to begin this discussion, I mean, well, hopefully we're going to get to lots of, I mean, I could probably make videos on this topic for the rest of my life. <laughs> but to begin this topic, I'm going to return to a previous coding challenge. Uh, you may remember me from coding challenges such as coding challenge number 36, Blobby. It's when I used to wear t-shirts with this other logo on them during my coding challenges. Uh, and by the way, I seem to have more gray hair there, but I think it's the lighting or something, because uh, somebody once asked me if I dye my hair, and I do not, but maybe I should. I have no idea. Anyway, that's not important. That's probably not going to get edited out, even though it should. And uh, yeah, OK, so what is the issue with Blobby? So I'm actually, even though I could just pull up that code, I'm going to speed code Blobby again. You're going to see, watch. This is like two coding challenges in one. Um, so I'm going to, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say uh, uh, let a equals 0, uh, a is less than 2 pi. I'm going to turn off auto refresh for a second. Um, and I'm, I'm working in the p5.js web editor, which I think is be a good demonstration of this. Uh, and then I, this is supposed to say four. I got, uh, so what I'm doing here, just in case you're wondering, is I'm writing a little for loop. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my polar to Cartesian coordinate song. And I'm going to say let x 
equal uh, r times cosine of that angle. Let y equal r times sine of that angle. And then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make up some value of r. Um, r is going to be 100. I'm going to translate to the center of the window. Um, and then I am going to say begin shape. I am going to say uh, end shape. And I'm going to set a vertex, uh, vertex at x, y. And I'm going to say, uh, no, and I spelled 2 pi with a 0, which is really complaining. I mean, I'm going to say a stroke 255 and no fill. And there we go. Look, I just wrote the code for drawing a circle. Because this is a for loop, I'm going to go through all these different angles. I'm going to calculate. I'm going to change. I'm going to increment the angle. I'm going to keep the radius constant, and I'm going to uh, set all the vertices x, y of the circle. Now, if r is random, and this is basically what I did in Blobby, if I say random 50 to 100, look what we've got. We've got this kind of like crazy flickering thing, and that's almost that's kind of interesting unto itself. And I could make this a little more evident by making the time step, the, not the time step, the the delta angle, the, the amount of angle, the amount of vertices I'm drawing, uh, fewer. I could make sure it connects at the end by saying close. And I could also, just for right now, say no loop. So we only get one of them. So each time I run this sketch, I'm going to get a new random pattern. Now here's the thing. This actually looks like it's a nice closed loop because it's all random. It doesn't matter if the last vertex doesn't match up with the first vertex. And I, you know, it would be somewhat smart of me to be more thoughtful about what this delta angle is. Like maybe it should be something that uh, divides perfectly into 2 pi or the radians uh, equivalent of 360 degrees. But again, I'm not going to worry about that. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to add Perlin noise to this. Now, if you've never heard of Perlin noise before, I will refer you to a playlist where I talk about what Perlin noise is and how it works and a whole bunch of other videos uh, related to this. Um, so go and watch those now if you want or uh, also link to some articles about Perlin noise. But I'm going to uh, assume knowledge of Perlin noise for the purpose of this, this coding challenge. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let uh, t equals zero. So I'm going to use t as my offset through the one-dimensional Perlinois space. I'm going to change that to x offset in a little bit, but let's just keep it a t right now. Then I'm going to say r is noise of t times 100. So interestingly enough, let me, we get a different size circle every time I run the sketch because we're getting a new randomly seeded set of Perlinois values. And the, I'm never moving through that time space, so each vertex is exactly the same. So what I want to do now is say in the loop t plus equal some amount of delta. So now you can see, look at this. Ooh, the, the amount is changing, but it doesn't match up. So first of all, let me clean this up a little bit by saying map. Let me use the map function, which I think is it will make things a little simpler. Perlin noise always has a range between 0 and 1. And let's say I want that range to go between like 100 and 200 now. So we can see, look at that. Now there's just this little, every time I run it, you can see that the last Perlin noise value doesn't match the first one. This is the problem. This is getting at this idea of a perfect Perlin noise loop. Um, and let's also have delta t, the amount, way I move through the Perlin noise space. Um, Siri, uh, what should delta t be? Tumbleweeds. Can we have like a tumbleweed animation and like the cricket sound effect going right now? That would be great. All right. So let me change that to this. And you can see even if I move T faster and I get this kind of smoother blobby-like shape, it always has this artifact. The last, and by the way, if I took off this close, this will be more evident. Why, right? The last vertex doesn't match up with the first one. This is the problem. So how are we going to solve through? So why, why does this happen? So I have my uh, title of this video right here, Perlin Noise Loops. Perlin Noise, if we're talking about one-dimensional Perlin Noise, Perlin Noise values in a one-dimensional space, with this being the t axis, the time axis, although really I should call this like x offset, because it's like the x offset, this is maybe a graph of those values. And if I'm arbitrarily going from 0 to some fixed endpoint as I get to the end of that circle, whatever value I get here, which maybe, let's say, if this is between like 0 and 1, maybe this is 0 0.3, and this is like 0 0.621, right? They don't match up. If I were to take this and twist it around into a circle, they don't match up. 
There is another way to look at a space of Perlin noise values. This is a way of looking at it in one dimension. Let's now look at it in two dimensions. So instead of having a sort of one dimensional graph of Perlin noise values, I present to you a grid of Perlin noise values. Now if we think of this grid as fairly like low resolution, and I'm gonna draw, uh, I don't know why I made those dotted lines. <laughs> like this is like basically a five by five grid right now if I, if I did my drawing correctly. The idea is, right, each one of these represents some value between zero and one. Now in this two dimensional space, each one of these values represents, uh, is also a number between zero and one. So I might have like 0.2 here, 0.3 here, and 0.31 here, and 0.26 here, and 0.19 here, right? Every single space has a value. Now here, in one dimension, any number in one dimensional space is quite similar to a, its neighbors. And it only has two neighbors, a neighbor on the left and a neighbor on the right, or a neighbor after and a neighbor before. Here, each value, has how many neighbors? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It has neighbors above and neighbors below and neighbors to the right and neighbors diagonally down. So the idea here is that what if I could walk around through a two-dimensional Perlin noise to get space, to get random values, and always end up back where I started? And why not just walk in a circular path? I mean, that's kind of what I'm programming anyway. So why not just do that? What if I were to start here and get this Perlin noise value, then this one, 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 then this one. I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 random numbers. And the last one is going to match up with the first one if I keep going. So I could get those those random numbers over and over again. And if that, if the amount of numbers there is so vast, it's going to appear like it is a continuous sequence of total randomness, smooth with Perlin noise. So this is the theory. So let's now go and apply this theory to this particular blobby shape. Um. Sorry, there is, I see a siren going off. Alert, polar noise on the whiteboard. What does that mean? Yeah, I should play the Perlin Noise song. Um, I also see in the chat that temp name is saying voice and video get more and more desynced over time. Um, I don't know how to resolve that. What I can tell you is that I do correct for that after the fact. So everything that I do in today's live stream, first of all, full live stream ends up archived on YouTube forever. <laughs> I mean, until the world ends and <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why that might happen sooner than later. But anyway, that aside, um, or, or uh, it's probably more likely that YouTube won't exist before the world ends. But anyway, I don't, what, this is not the, this is not the discussion. Um, but, um, oh, but then I also edit out uh, chunks and those do not, and, and, and resync the audio uh, if necessary. Several people are typing. I just want to know what the, what the uh, alert symbol and polar noise on the whiteboard, question mark, question mark, if that was some sort of issue that I'm. Oh, yes. No, I wrote it polar noise on purpose. Got it. I wrote it as polar noise on purpose. I mean, it should say polar. I don't know if you can, did I write that out of view? Mostly, yes. I wrote it as polar on purpose. Even the, it's a term that I made up that probably means nothing and is terribly misleading and everybody wants to complain. All right, I see. Are we all satisfied now? Okay. Poor <laughs> Simon in the chat writes, Porlin noise. That's actually really good. Why isn't it, why isn't it poor or, or perlar? Maybe it's perlar noise. Anyway, okay. All right. So actually, before I come back here, I want to... 
Let me just open up processing real quick. It's the pull. Um, just want to grab something real quick, which is just give me a second here. What am I looking for? Not pixel flow. I'm looking for math. Basics? Is it under basics? Math. Noise 2D. There we go. Okay. Ooh. Interesting. Let me let me comment this out. There we go. Might as well cycle the cameras while I'm here, taking a short break from the actual content. And now I'm coming back. So coming back to the computer, what I've opened up here is a processing sketch that is visualizing Perlin noise in a 2D space. So this is showing you a sort of the classic visualization of exactly this idea. And in that visualization, each number, a number between zero and one, is mapped to a pixel brightness. So here you see you get the... Thank you. Thank you. Let's try that again. I really shouldn't put the soundboard so close to my uh, keyboard where I switch the camera. <laughs> um, let me just go back all the way because that was, all right. So before I get back to the blobby code, what I have here is a processing sketch that is visualizing Perlin noise in a two-dimensional space. So this is a pretty sort of like classic visualization of 2D Perlin noise as this cloudy-like texture. And this is literally <laughs> exactly this, where each number, each random Perlin noise value in the two-dimensional space is represented as a pixel with a brightness value between 0 and 255. And when you look at that, you get this cloud-like pattern because the color seamlessly smoothly moves between white to black to gray to black to gray to white. So the idea here is what is what I want to do is walk around this space and pull those numeric values but map them to something else besides a pixel value. And walking around in a circle is a nice way to create a loop, but you don't necessarily have to have that be in a circle. All right, so let's go back to the blobby code. Now, there's something that's a, there's a bit confusing about this because in addition to the walking around the Perlin noise space in a circular path, I also happen to be walking around the 2D canvas in a circular path to draw this uh, circular shape. So I'm, I'm kind of using the same idea but with two, two different points of view um, and hopefully that is something that makes sense to you. Hmm. Okay. Um, so what I want to change this is I no longer want to have T. What I want to have is X offset. I'm going to say I want to have an X offset and a Y offset. And I want to get the Perlin noise at x offset, y offset. Okay. Now, uh, t is not, t is not, t is not. Where do I have t still? Ah, t is moving up. Let's check that out. Okay. So this is now what I had before. If the Perl, if the x offset and the y offset, right? Basically, if what I'm doing is I'm asking for what is the Perlin noise value at this spot. It's going to give me some random value, and then I'm, it's going to make that the radius of the circle, the blob shape, as it goes all the way around. So I want to start moving, but I actually don't want to start here. I want to start over here. So I have to deal with the fact that I, uh, the, the, that I need to find this point if 0, 0 is in the top left, because I can't have negative values in the Perlin noise space. So this is a little bit of a tricky piece of this. But I want to use that same polar 2 Cartesian coordinate formula, where I want to say x offset equals cosine of that angle, y offset equals sine of that angle. Now look at this. 
I've kind of got something, but it's weirdly symmetrical. And the reason is, this is exactly what I just alluded to, I, these x offset and y offset values are going between negative 1 and 1. And so in fact, I'm trying to look at Perlin noise values over here. right? And these, this doesn't exist. The Perlin noise space is all positive. So there's actually a very simple solution to this, which is just to add 1. Like that, and suddenly, ooh, yeah, I think so. And let me add the close back in. And let's run this a bunch of times, and we can see, there we go. We have this nice, random, blobby shape where the end matches the beginning. Now, I want to do, let's do some more stuff here. All right, so first of all, I, I, where, what happened to that, like, incrementer? What happened to t plus equal 0 0.01. Now I have x offset and y offset. Why aren't I saying x offset plus equal 1, 0.1, y offset plus equal 1, 1? Well, actually, the incrementer is this. It is the 0.1 here. It's cosine of the angle. And in truth, I could have a separate variable from the one that's incrementing in the loop because I, I could move through. But, but, but I need to go all the way to 2 pi. So that, that I don't want to do. I think a way for me to vary this in a more flexible way is actually to use the map function. So if I map cosine of a, which goes between negative 1 and 1, and then map that to a range between 0 and 2, we have, and this is sine, we have exactly what I had before. And I can keep, I can keep rerunning the sketch, and I'm getting a new, a new version of the shape. But interestingly enough, what happens? This is really now something that I should make a parameter. So, for example, what if I were to say, let I'm going to make this a global variable. Let um, I'm going to call this noise max equal two. And I'm going to put this here. And watch what happens if I make this five versus ten versus 120 versus 0 0.1. And look at this, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Look at this. This is really kind of interesting. With just a little bit of noise, I have what appears almost like a perfect circle, but it kind of looks like a human being like me with faults, I have lots of faults, drew that circle. It's got some slight, so Perlin noise can actually be used as a nice way with a little subtle Perlin noise of making some perfect shape, like a letter form or a circle or a square, have a little bit of wiggle to it that makes it seem more hand-drawn. So that's a nice thing to see. The other thing we could see here very quickly is like, you know, uh, it would make sense for me to create a uh, slider I'm going to say, and this I'm using the p5dom library to do this, which is a really quick way. I'm going to create a slider which has a range between like 0.1 and 10, and I'm going to start it at uh, 0. Actually, let's make it between 0 and 10, and I'm going to start it at 0. So I have the slider here now, and then I want noise max to equal, noise max to equal slider.value. So watch this. Okay, that didn't work. <laughs> Create slider. The range goes between 0 and 10. Hold on a sec. Let's take this out. Oh, I have no loop in here. No wonder. Take out the no loop, and now let me slide it. Oh, we need to make that. Uh, so first of all, I need to give myself smaller time steps when moving the slider. So let's do this. Oh, look at that. Look how it kind of like unfurls because it's the same noise space, I'm just stretching or shrinking it. That is a really, and imagine now if I oscillated that, like along a sine wave. Oh, that is super interesting. And I could also make, just out of curiosity, I could make this go to like 100. I should make it go to 11. <laughs> that makes me so happy. If it goes to 11, but really it should go to like 111. And watch this. I guess it's hard to detect that subtleness, but you, we could animate that more slowly over time. Um, so the slider isn't the best way of demonstrating that, but you'll see a lot of possibilities here. Another thing that I could um, demonstrate here, and let's just put it at 5 to start. Whoops. Uh, oh, no, it goes to 5 and then 0 0.1. So, all right. So another thing that I could demonstrate to you is interesting. Like, A always starts at 0 because I'm going from 0 to 2 pi, 
But if I am walking around the path of a circle, there's no reason why I couldn't start over here and then go around, or start over here and then go around, and why not vary that? That would be like the phase. If you go back to my Fourier transform, all of this stuff is so crazily interrelated, it's amazing. But if you go back to my Fourier transform uh, videos where we created these orbiting epicycles, we had this concept of phase, which is where does that orbit start? So let me show you another thing here. Okay, uh, what I'm gonna do is show you, uh, so let me make a variable called phase. Let me have that be zero. I'm gonna have cosine of angle plus phase, sine of angle plus phase. What do you think's going to happen if I increment phase? Well, it looks like the shape is rotating. I mean, it is rotating, or it's not rotating. I mean, visually it's rotating, but I'm actually just starting at a different point of the no noise space. Interestingly enough, like, and if I make that much smaller, you'll actually see that, like, smaller than the amount of vertices I have, you start to see a wiggle between them. So interesting, like, I could make this point two, and that's gonna be even more apparent. Like, look at that crazy, weird wiggle as those vertices adjust their spot, and then, I want to show you something even crazier, I think. Like, let me put it back. Let me sync it. So this is like a nice, perfect rotation. What if I only apply the phase to the x offset or the y offset, like different phases? That is really, oh, it's kind of too fast. So let me do like this. Like, this is really weird. You can sort of see it's almost like there's something crawling around the edge. Ah, there's so much weirdness stuff going on. So you, anyway, you see the sort of like, exciting possibilities of thinking about Perl and noise values as one-dimensional values that we might pull over time in a, in a sort of one-dimensional fashion, but actually pull them from the path of a circle in the two-dimensional Perl and noise space. Now, what I happen to be doing in this is taking a very literal approach. I'm taking those Perl and noise path path values walking around a circle and applying them to like the distance from the center of a circle over time, uh, as I'm drawing it. So it's very like, it's a very literal sort of like visualization of Perl and noise values in a circle to the edge points of a circle. But if you start to think of other ways you could apply those values, the creative possibilities explode. And so in other words, if this is what I started with, I have Perl and noise at the beginning. Uh, sorry, I have Perl and noise values in one dimensional space, but they don't loop. Why not take those looping values here along the path of the circle and then unfurl them back into this sort of one dimensional line and then use those to apply to any value in any visualization to make a perfect GIF loop? That's the idea. So I'm gonna just put that out there. I'm putting this out into the universe. I mean, I didn't put it out in the universe. Lots of other people, Etienne and Golan and many others I'm sure I'm forgetting to reference, have done this for years. Um, so give that a try. In the next video, I'm gonna come back and actually do that. So I'm gonna see if I can take this idea and just apply it to something. Probably won't be that visually interesting, um, but this will hopefully give you lots of ideas of what you might make, okay? So thanks for watching this coding challenge uh, where we now have this kind of blobby thingy. Oh, wait, wait, wait! I should really add the third dimension here. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Eh. I'm trying to decide. Should I make the third dimension? This is so weird. Um, yeah, I think I will. Okay. Let's add one more thing to this. I think I, have, I think I can. This video is not too long so far. All right, let's add one more thing. So first of all, let me take out this idea of phase for a second. I'm just going to comment that out and put it back to what it was, which is just this. So every time I run it, I get a new Perl and noise space. And incidentally, the only reason why I'm getting a new Perl and noise space is because P5, behind the scenes, will seed Perl and noise with a random seed each time. But I could actually control it. If I were to say, you know, noise 
seed and pick some arbitrary seed value and random number seeds is maybe a topic for another video. Every time I run this, like I'm going to get exactly the same shape each time. So anyway, just point that out. But there is something else. There's another way I could animate this and it has to do with three-dimensional Perlin noise. And Perlin noise can exist in any n-dimensional space. In P5 and in processing, I think the, uh, the functions that give it to you just support one, two, and three dimensions. But let's talk about how you might use three dimensions here. So for example, if this is my visualization of Perlin noise in two-dimensional space, that cloudy image, well, I could make sort of like a cloudy set of cubes in three-dimensional space, but another way of thinking about it is have that third dimension be slices of an animation. So I could show you the Perlin noise space uh, uh, at, over time while incrementing a z value, a z offset, and show you Perlin noise for at z offset equals zero, then z offset equals 0 0.1, then 0 0.2, then 0.3. And so that actually, all of those will have numbers, you know, each one of these numbers is now has all of its neighbors uh, to up and down and left and right and forward and backward are similar random values. So this is actually a really easy thing for me to add. I just need one more global variable called z off offset. And this needs to be global because I'm not resetting it back every time through draw. Each time through draw, I'm incrementing it. And I can just add z off right there to the Perlin noise function. And then I can say z off plus equal some amount like 0.1. And you can see we get this wiggle. I can make it 0 0.01. And I'm going to move through the Perlin noise space much more slowly. Um, and once again, we could see like there's all sorts of things I could do here. Like this could be 0 0.3. And this could be 0.1. You know, there's so many parameters that you can explore here. Uh, I think we've made actually a super interesting uh, uh, shape for like a crazy animated game version of asteroids. Like you can imagine having Perlin noise jiggling, oscillating, uh, looping, noisy, polar asteroids. That's a thing you should make. Um, so anyway, so I hope you find some variations for this. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you make. And stay tuned for the next video. A torus shape. Yes, a torus shape. Increase resolution. Uh, All right. I probably should have, if I thought about this, made the stroke weight two for it to be a bit more, give it a little more pop, a little more zing. <laughs> Gotta have zing. Coding Train, sponsored by Zing. Zing! I have an idea. How hard is it gonna be to Uh, can I just get the mic like, I can just do this, right? Mic equals p5.audio in, and then I can just have uh, this be, um, is it get level? No. Get volume? Shoot, P5 sound. I just wanted to tie it to the sound real quick. Um, audio in. It's funny, there's, apparently there's a video about this where I'm wearing a tinfoil hat because I really, really, mic input. My, oh, mic dot start. Mic got, get level, P5 dot audio in. Okay, what did I miss, what did I miss? p5.audio in, mic.start, mic.getlevel. Do I not have the sound library imported? This, this was meant for me to just do one thing really quickly to make this fun, because it's, cannot read property start of undefined. Hold on, I was just there in the code. Um, P5 audio in, mic.start, mic.getlevel, mic.start. <laughs> oh, I forgot to show this, but whatever. Uh, okay, I don't know what did I have wrong there. It's so weird. I must have had something spelled wrong. Okay, ready? Here we go. And 
Here we go. Oh, really? It's not picking that up? Test. And I'm going to say once again, here we go. Sing it with <laughs> Dude, my whole idea of taking a little break and just putting this on. Oh, I forgot the new. Okay, thank you, everybody. New P5 audio amp. Um, how come? Oh, is it? Uh, uh. Hold on. Oh, it's just so quiet. Wow. And I should I should also have the phase going. So it spins. Test one, two. Test one, two. Noise. Oh, this has to. Do. Test one, two. Test one, two. And then, hold on. I don't know why I'm like trying to make something interesting out of this. That's not my job. <laughs> I'm terrible at that. Uh, let's do this. It's the polar to Cartesian coordinate song. Here we go. And I'm gonna say once again, here we go. Sing it with me. It's the polar to Cartesian coordinate song. All right, and we're back. <laughs> um, all right, I probably should have, I probably, I'm gonna hit save. I probably should put this back to what it was. Because <laughs> this is, let me just do a duplicate. Um, and that will be, this will be the noise loop audio in, just in case, I'll, I'll publish this as well, even though it's not like part of the coding challenge. And let me just go file open, um, and just go to this noise loop. Let me get rid of the audio in thing. Um, and put this back. Uh, and put, what is this now? Yeah, what, why not? I can leave the weird little background thing in. Um, interesting. Sorry, I can't resist playing with this. Okay, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop, I have to stop, okay. Uh, can you check Twitter for generative arts? I don't know what that means. Let me save, I have to stop. Um, and now what I wanna do is, um, do this. Okay, this is too frenetic. I want something more soothing and relaxing. It's too frenetic. Uh, maybe Z offset is too much. Yeah, that's nicer. Um, although, and then it should be this. Yes, okay, and 
All right, <laughs> I'm gonna stop doing what I'm doing and I am going to um, go back to this. All right, so I have to think about what is it that, oh, what is the example that I'm gonna demonstrate now with turning this into a loop? I mean, I guess I can make the most, and actually somebody had suggested to me a GIF library. Now I know I wanted to use this P5 GIF library. So um, uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, shoot. Um, Just finding something here for a second. Um, P5 GIF, okay. So there's this library, but somebody pointed out to me a library that uses web workers. Uh, GIF, Canvas, JavaScript, web workers. Let's see if this comes out. If it was in a YouTube comment, this is it. So I'm curious to try this. Add frame. Add frame delay. Copy. How do I know when it's finished? How do I? Oh, render. Okay. All right. So I'm curious to try this gif.js library. I do love this library that was created by my students, but it had a few bugs in it. I'm sort of curious to try this. Probably not a good idea to try a library for the first time <laughs> during a live stream, but why not? Oh, I forgot to mention this, but that's fine. Uh, we're back to here. I can turn this off and we've got this. All right. Okay. Do web workers work in the P5 editor? I guess we're gonna find out. <laughs> Maybe I should try this real quick. If you, if you will all bear with me for a second. Um, so is this hosted with a CDN? Um, I don't know. Maybe I need to download the library dist. Oh, I need all this? I'm so confused. Um, let's download this. Whoops. Um, and I assume I also need this. Let me do uh, duplicate. Let me add uh, these files. That seemed to have worked. Um, let me add this here. Uh, gif.worker.js and gif.js. Okay, no errors, so to speak. Uh, let's put this back to 400 by 400. Uh, now what I need to do, if this is gonna work, is I can create a new gif. Get rid of this mic. Not, let me take off auto refresh. That's going to make it crazy. Uh, let's try just doing this. Add frame canvas element. I think I should be able to say uh, gif add frame. Uh, okay, so I need to say let canvas 
canvas equals create canvas, canvas.elt. I don't want this delay. Let's just take that out. That should do that. Let's just see, does this give me an error? No error as far as I can tell. And then uh, what I need here is on finished. And then uh, gif.render. Maybe I'll do render on, um, I'll make a button. Button, uh, button equals create button, render, and then button dot mouse pressed, uh, gif, what was it, gif dot render. So this should, in theory now, I'm adding frames, I'm adding frames, I click render. <laughs> that didn't seem to work. <laughs> Let's check the console. Uh, the server responded with a status of 404. So maybe I can't do a web worker. Oh, I couldn't find, all right, I'm gonna have to investigate this more. Uh, All right, everybody, uh, Alvaro writes, uh, could create a circular path in Z offset so that GIF is also periodic in time. Exactly. All right, so I'm gonna have to investigate this later. Already running, okay, hold on. Oh, because the worker's running? I don't even, let's completely refresh. Probably shouldn't be trying this in the web editor. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to give up on this now. <laughs> it's good that I tried doing it, that I know that this doesn't work. Uh, and let's go back to here. Okay. How come this? Maybe it didn't save, actually. All right, actually, hold on, hold on. Just give me one more second. I wonder if I just hit that weird saving bug. This is it, right? Noi GIF test. Uh, no. All right, I'm not, okay. This is... So what I'm going to do, if you don't mind humoring me for a second, so I'm going to switch to processing. <laughs> Hello. Processing. There we go. Um, and then what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, desktop. Let me just quickly convert this code to processing. Uh, okay, same exact thing. And let me simplify, let me get rid of this phase. Okay. Okay. 
All right. Just check the time. So the reason why I want to use processing is I also want to, this is GIF loop, oh that's not right, GIF polar, like I'm going to call this polar noise blob, okay, and then I, what I now need is, um, I need this code, elevate and processing, until I have a solid way to generate the GIF in, um, in JavaScript, I'm going to use processing for making these GIF loops. Um, so let me open this, so that's this, okay, so this is the GIF loop. And this is the blob. And this is this. All right. Okay, uh, increment i by radians one, interesting. Okay, that's an interesting thing to try. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, part two is coming up right now. Sorry, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> Hello and welcome to part two of the Polar. <laughs> Hello and welcome. <sighs> Hello and welcome to part two of the Polar Perlin noise loops. I wrote polar noise loops on purpose as like a wordplay thing. But people kept saying, no, 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 it's perlin noise, perlin noise. Yes, yes, polar, perlin noise loops. The whole point of this is I'm doing a follow-up of my previous coding challenge where I made this blobby shape, which is created with a perlin noise algorithm, and the end of the shape matches up to the beginning of the shape by walking through a two-dimensional perlin noise uh, space in, in a circle. Wah! Wait, hold on. Time out. This is a good time for me to show Golan's uh, GIF. Golan sketch. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, uh, go and watch the previous video, but also I forgot in the previous video, I neglected to show this particular sketch created in P5.js by Golan Levin, which demonstrates this idea. So the idea is I want to use Perlin noise values over time, but I want the last value to match up with the first value. And so if I pull those values from a circular path, and in truth, it doesn't have to be circular, as long as I end up where I started, then I'm gonna have this perfect looping Perlin noise. So why not take that perfect looping Perlin noise and apply it to my GIF loop so that I can, in this, in, this, in the GIF loop coding challenge, I just had this rotating circle. It's very easy to have the end match up with the beginning. But what if what I want to create with is random, chaotic, algorithmic scenes of beauty? And an example, an artist who does this is Etienne Jacob. Um, and you can read more about this work at necessary or, necessarydisorder.wordpress.com. This is a blog post from 
uh, November 15th, 2017. You can find many more of these like amazing gifts uh, on uh, ATN's Twitter account, all of which I will link to in this video's description. So this, this video is inspired by the beautiful work and this, this just is mind blowing to me. This is, not, this is not a sketch running over time. It is a perfect loop, yet it seems as if it's just a continuous random chaos. So how are we gonna achieve this? So uh, admittedly, I think by the end of this video, I'm gonna end up creating something incredibly simple but I hope it will unlock a superpower for you, which is polar Berlin noise loops. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's go. Let's go back to all this stuff. So what do I? What do I want first? Uh, I want to go. And by the way, I've in <laughs> in the in between the last video and this current one. Come on, computer, respond to me. <clears throat> I get a perfect connection if you increment i by radians one. I see, I see. All right. Uh, in, between, in between the previous video and this one, uh, why is this not open? Why, 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 why? Come on. Uh, stop. There it is. Oh, it's just there. Why? It should, it should switch windows when I click on this. This is a bug in processing now. It doesn't seem to be working. Is it because it's running? Switch. No. Switch. <laughs> oh, processing. Oh, processing. All right, I'll just do this. It's fine. It's fine. This is the one I want right now anyway. So one thing you might have noticed is in the previous video, I was working in JavaScript. I have now moved over to uh, Java using the processing development environment. This is mostly because what I want to do now is render files out that I can then repackage into a GIF. You can do that in JavaScript too, um, but I haven't found like a really excellent, elegant solution for doing that yet. So when I'm working with rendering, I generally prefer to be in processing. And also I like to just show you different things. So I have ported that code, it's the exact same code, but I'm in processing now. And so what I want to do is first, let me get rid of, so to speak, this, um, uh, this visualization entirely. I should really start over. <laughs> I'm trying to think, yeah. Because I wonder why that. Actually, let me not get rid of the visualization entirely. Let me, let me get rid of this visualization entirely first. So I don't really care about this R thing right now. Um, and I do, uh, I do care about um, this. Um, hold on, sorry, I'm getting confused here. Oh, what am I doing? And I'm typing let, just give me a second here. I know what I want to say. I know what I want to say. <laughs> it's a different shape now. So let me get rid of the fact that there is a loop in draw to start. And what I actually want is for, uh, and I want to get rid of this begin shape, end shape. And, what, and uh, uh, what I want is for that angle variable, that's to be a, uh, that a variable to be a global variable. So I'm gonna say float a equals zero, and I'm going to here just increment a by some arbitrary amount over time. And this, this, uh, I'm gonna have to be more thoughtful about this, but let me just change that. And then let me also then say ellipse at x, y, a 16, 16. So what is happening here? Right now, oh, that is moving super fast. So let's say 0 0.01. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually having that circle, tr I'm having an ellipse trace along that path that was previously that strange shape. So I don't, I don't really care about mapping the noise value right now. I just want to be able to see it. So let's just say um, r equals 100 just to see it. Okay, so I have this, uh, I don't like what I'm doing. Let, just give me another shot at this. Give me another shot at this. Because what I want to do, oh uh, yeah, okay, give me another shot at this. Okay. <clears throat> Me, I am so me, there is a GIF library for P5. 
go and look at the one that I just referenced. I'll send it to you. It just needs a little help. <laughs> I don't think it's ready for prime time, um, but it actually is quite, there's many things about it that are awesome. Okay. Use circle. I'll use circle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, so let me start adjusting this code to get the Perlin noise values from walking around the perimeter of that circle. So all of the stuff that I'm drawing here with this blobby thing is kind of irrelevant at this point. And in fact, I don't need to have a loop inside draw anymore. So I'm going to take out that loop. I'm going to take out all the drawing stuff. I'm going to take out begin shape. Uh, I'm going to take out all the drawing stuff. This translate. And what I am, what I need now, what I'm left with, and I don't need this x and y either, what I'm left with is the fact that this angle, this a value, needs to be a global variable. So this now is, let's, I'm just going to, I'm going to just change this. This is now, right here, all I'm doing, C, <laughs> is increasing, in draw, increasing the angle over time and asking for the noise value. And I don't, I'm going to take out map even. I'm just trying to simplify this. Really, really simplify it. The idea here is that I'm saying, OK, I just want to have, and why is it giving complaining to me about what art? Oh, because I'm not using it. <laughs> I, I swear, just give me one more shot at this. I, now I understand what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to undo out of this. I, I really understand what I'm doing now. I know you don't believe me. I mean, you're right to not believe me. <laughs> I wouldn't believe me either. So let me just answer a quick question. Usagi Yojimbo in the chat asked, if this is Java, how is it possible to use functions outside of a class? So this is processing. And processing is, um, is a programming development environment with its own set of functions um, that is built on top of Java. And it actually obscures the main class for you. So you can actually just write kind of procedural code just in a simple text editor without all of the Java, Java mumbo jumbo, but it also does support the Java mumbo jumbo if you like the Java mumbo jumbo. All right, here we go. <coughs> all right, here we go. Here we go. So now I'm going to start with this code, but I'm basically I'm going to remove <laughs> almost all of it because what I want ultimately is I just want a single noise value over time walking along the perimeter of a circle. So the idea of looping inside draw is no longer relevant, so I can take that out. The idea of drawing anything is no longer relevant, so I can take that out. I don't need this translate. What I do need is this idea of calling the noise function in two-dimensional space based on an angle that's incrementing over time around the perimeter of a circle. So now that angle has to be a global variable. That angle, every time through draw, gets incremented by some amount. And I'm gonna, when I want to make a GIF loop, I'm going to change that to the percentage thing, because I want to go from 0 all the way to 2 pi. Um, and that's the end of the GIF loop. That closes the loop. But, um, <laughs> but for now, just incrementing it by an arbitrary amount is fine. And if I were to say print line r, um, let's watch this go. So if I run this, what we're seeing is the noise values. Now, this is looping. You can't tell, but I'm getting the same noise values over and again. Except not really, because 0.1 isn't perfectly divisible by 2 pi. But I'm not going to worry about that. Um, uh, uh, David Snyder actually pointed out that if I use the radiance functions, like 360 divides into 1 perfectly. So I could say like, or it divides into 10 even. So I can plus equal radians of 1. This will actually now give me a perfect loop. Thank you for that uh, suggestion. So, now what I need to do is map those noise values to something. So I'm, I could do color, I could do position, I could do size. 
let's have it, let's have a do position. I think that's kind of a very literal way of looking at it. So I'm going to now say x equals map r, which has a range between 0 and 1, to 0 and width. I'm going to use the circle function because it's my favorite function. x comma uh, height divided by 2, uh, 100. And now I'm going to do this. And we can see this looks like randomness, right? This looks like randomness. This looks like smooth randomness, Perlin noise. But I, it is a repeating pattern. Hard to see that repeating pattern, but it is there. So now what I want to do, if I go back to my GIF loop code, and this is from a previous coding challenge. They're all kind of interconnected at this point. What I want to do now is take this idea. So I need this global variable A to come over here. I need to take all of this, which is in previously in draw, and it goes into render my render. I'm going to paste it in here. And then uh, A, the difference is A doesn't increment. A is based on the percentage. So A equals the percentage times 2 pi. Because if you recall from this video, this video was designed, this code example was designed to render frame by frame some looping pattern from 0% up to 100%. And now that I know that my Perlin noise values will loop as I go from 0 to 2 pi, I can take the percentage of how far am I through 2 pi. So let me run this now. And we can see, there we go. Now, I believe this will be a perfect loop. I can't tell. Can you tell that this is a perfect loop? I, can, um, I could increase the number of frames to slow it down. I could change the noise. There's a bunch of things I could do. But let me leave it like that. And now I am going to turn on recording. I'm going to say record equals true. This is the system I set up before. If I say record equals true, it's going to save out to a folder, a whole bunch of frames. Let me make sure there's nothing in that folder right now. No, so I'm going to do this. It's going to quit when it's done. And now, all, and now if I go to the folder in output, we can see I have, oh, there's a bit of a problem. That was weird. The first frame, it draws it at the center and then jumps. Is that, was that a coincidence or is that actually right? Huh. No, I think, it's, I think it should be fine. Um, all right, I think I got it right. Let's, let's turn that into a GIF and see if it loops. Take time out for a second. Uh, so before I use that easy GIF thing, someone was telling me that um, maybe now I should use a command line tool like FFmpeg. Uh, how to make GIFs with FMMPEG. Mm. Does anybody know off the top of their head what the command for, so first of all, do I have FFMPEG installed? Okay, so that's, uh, oh, run away from FFmpeg. I just like, I really kind of hated uh, bringing up easygift.com. I mean, it was fine for that video, but since I have it in the video, there's no reason why I couldn't show another, uh, another solution, like a command line utility. Gifsicle. Let's look at this on GitHub. Yeah. June 1st, 2018. That's almost less than a year ago. <laughs> uh, so Alvaro has asking, could we make an animation in which periodicity is more obvious? Yeah, the... Um, the ffmpeg i something something output dot gif um, hamalot.io 
How to FFmpeg PNG files to GIF. Um, how to FFmpeg PNG files. Is that like the search I want to do? Oh, so this. Where, where percent 03D is the frame ID in three digits. It's interesting. Um, Gifsicle is good at recommended. Okay, people are telling me Gifsicle is recommended. Um, uh, world GIF, GIF merge. How do I install it? I don't want to install it with Mac ports. Homebrew, Mac ports. Oh, do I have brew installed? Yeah, apparently I do. All right, let's try it. Brew, what do I do? I like brew install Gifsicle? How do you spell Gifsicle? Success! That totally worked. Oh, what a world we live in. Welcome to 2019, everybody. Can't create update lock in little blah, 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 blah. Okay, sure, why not? That looks reasonable. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Permission denied. No, I did that. Okay, this, okay. Oh, promising. Okay. Gifsicle. Gifsicle is hard to spell. Gifsicle is a terminal. Okay. Start on GIF. So probably something like this. Delay equals 10 dash dash loop star dot GIF. Okay. So my guess is gif sickle dash dash loop star dot png uh, test dot gif. File is not in gif format. That didn't work. Yeah, I know. That's why it's in PNG. It's in PNG. So I have to say, uh, let's check the chat. Shouldn't we use MP4 with HTML5 instead of GIFs on the web already? Uh, probably, 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 probably. Needs to be in a GIF format. Gifsicle only allows a GIF format. I'm back to FFmpeg. Do I have FFmpeg installed? FFmpeg. Boy, I'm not even going to get to the um, inheritance stuff today, am I? I'm, I'm going to. I can make it happen. All right, let's try. Uh, is there any other documentation here? So uh, install FFmpeg Mac. Ah. Okay, hold on. Let's, let's try to find the official source here. Okay. Oh, look. Install, install, documentation, documentation. Download? Sure. Download. Look at this. All right. Oh, hold on. Is this a static build for Mac OS? Okay, ooh. Ooh. Let's try this. Release snapshot. Ooh. Ah. Let's jet the release. Ah. Oh my god. This is terrifying. Yes, Simon, I see the um, I see what you're putting there in terms of the millisecond stuff. Oops. 
Will this install for me? Let's try this. Here I am just installing FFmpeg. <laughs> oh, it gives me, literally gives me the actual, I can put, I, this, uh, it's up to me to put it in like user local bin on my own. I guess I could install it with, let's just install it with brew. I'm afraid of brew, but this is, oh, why not? All right, <laughs> this'll do. Okay. All right. Jiri Dolichek is giving me a nice command. Can somebody who's watching, can somebody paste that command into uh, the Slack channel? Because it's going to scroll past too fast for me to re remember it. All right. All right, so we've got FFmpeg. All right, that's promising. So there was a command. Let's get rid of this. Um, okay, so now ffmpeg-f, what's image two? Why do I have image two there? Y image two, I guess that's like convert image two, like convert dash frame rate one, okay, dash I gif dash percent D dot PNG and then test dot gif is my file name. Let's try this. Uh, in the range zero through four. Um, so I think this isn't right because, um, do I have to do this like something like that? No. So what would it be? Let's just try this, just curious. Okay, so that worked, but I have a feeling it only used it only probably used the first 10 frames, right? But let's see if it actually made something. Whoops. Ah. Oh, it's nice and slow. I love that. Yeah, it's only the first 10 frames. And why is it such a big jump in the first one? Dash F image two, so zero three D. Okay, ah, it's three D, it's three D. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Percent three D. Okay, let's try that. Uh, no. No. Famous last words. Mm. Percent three D. Percent zero three? Let's try that. No. Can I just do like star.png? <laughs> Can I just do this? No. Percent zero three D because they're zero padded. No. The docs could help. No, I don't have to look at the docs. That's why I have a live chat going. You're all supposed to look up at the docs for me and give me the correct answer. <laughs> the problem is you're like 30 seconds behind, so.
zero zero percent appreciation. That shouldn't work. That's not gonna work. No. I mean, I could write them out without it being zero. All right. <laughs> That's definitely not right. Uh, I don't even remember where I was. Oh, whoa, 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 what if I do this? I have an idea. I have an idea. Won't it just work for me to do this? Can I just do that? No? Wrong directory? <gasps> oh no! Oh no! Oh no, I'm in the wrong directory. Oh. Breaking news. Breaking I've been news. in the wrong directory the whole time. Ah, why did that happen? How did that happen? Wait, hold on. Oh, so sad. There we go. Yes, overwrite. So I think this is a bad example because it is too, it's moving too quickly, but it does work. I do like this as a new technique though. Um, so hold on. So let me go back. Now that I know that this works, um, the question is, how can I make this a more illustrative example? Would just doing this, no that's, uh, would having more frames? No. Oh, I don't want to record right now. How could I make this example more illustrative of the idea that I'm trying to demonstrate? Um, yeah, so this, slowing it down would help. Maybe that's just what I want to do. Okay. FFmpeg can do frame interpolation. That's a cool idea. Make it go in a circle without noise so it's clear it's looping. Oh, like. Add in, um, all right, so this is a good idea. Let's add in, I have an idea, okay. Okay, thank you, that's a good idea. Do the same as Golan, yeah, okay. Um, hold on a sec. I'm gonna put my. So actually, let me stop for a second because, right. let me stop for a second because this example I think isn't very illustrative of the point that I'm trying to make. First of all, it's moving so quickly that you could probably fake the idea of it looping pretty easily even without a perfect loop. So let me see if I can um, demonstrate this more clearly. Number one is let me also, <laughs> in addition to drawing that circle, let me draw something moving uh, in a circular pattern. So I'm gonna translate to the middle. Um, I'm gonna give myself a, a radius of 100 pixels. Um, and then I'm just gonna draw a line from zero, zero to a radius. Uh, actually, let me, let me, let me, give it, let me cal calculate an X and Y again. X equals radius times cosine of that angle. Uh, y equals radius times sine of that angle. Um, 
and I'm going to do, I'm just going to make these other names, um, x1, y1, I'm going to draw that line and then draw a point, um, draw another little circle, uh, another circle at x1, y1, uh, that's smaller. So let me run this for a second. So this should, all right, and let me say uh, a stroke, let me also add a stroke 255. And um, I, I kind of wanted to go the other way around, but whatever. So, and then let me make this circle um, have a bit of color to it. Uh, fill, um, let me just, actually, let me just give it a little bit of alpha. Okay, so the idea here now is that this is definitely a perfect loop in the sense that that circle is rotating perfectly. Now, can I make this thing that's moving randomly also loop? I think one way to demonstrate this idea is just to really slow down its movement. So if I change the noise max to one, um, and probably also, I think what would be helpful is let me make it much wider um, so that, um, uh, and I'm, uh, so that it's kind of moving at a, at a, at, with more, with more variation left and right. Um, so now it's my, my argument that this is a perfect noise loop. I'm seeing the exact circular loop, and I'm just, to, just so this is visually a bit more clear, <laughs> let me also make the stroke weight four so you can see these a bit more easily. So the circular loop is looping perfectly as a circle, but the Perlin noise value is also looping, which is mapped to its x, y, to the x position of that other circle. Okay, let's render this now. So I'm gonna switch this to true, as I was about to do before, and I'm going to render it out. So we're gonna run this. When it finishes its loop, it stops. I'm gonna look in now, look in the output. I'm gonna look at the first one, which we can see the circle is, oh, that's weird. Why is there no stroke around that circle? I think that might have some kind of weird error with the first frame. <gasps> that is so weird. Why, 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 what's going on? Uh, if render percent, if record, output, why is the first one not like a fully finished version of this? So weird. Hold on, there's like a weird bug going on here. Let me delete the output again. Why, 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 why? Why is the first frame, <gasps> oh! Oh, I don't have the stroke here. Ah, everybody. Sorry, sorry, there's just a weird little silly bug which is not that important, which is that I have the stroke set after drawing that first circle. That was just a mistake. So that's why it wasn't appearing in the first frame. I can run this again. Someone also gave me a nice suggestion, which is to put this, to put this circle actually um, also at the same Y position, which is kind of interesting. Um, let's try this just really briefly. Yeah, so this is kind of in, whoa. Oh yeah, but it's offset. Okay, hold on everybody. Everything's gonna be fine. Let me make this a little nicer. Let me move, let me translate everything. Let me calculate all the values before I draw everything. And then also I want this to be, I have an idea. Oh, this is gonna be so much better now. Now I want this, the x value to be mapped between negative width and width times two, which is gonna put it all over the place. Okay, so now you're gonna see this, okay, so there we go. So that looks like it's moving chaotically, which it is. Let me do this one more time. Sort of entering in, moving around. <laughs> it left, okay, that was too extreme. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't like give it such an extreme. Let me just do negative width divided by two and, uh, uh, let me do like, let me do like point, oh, just negative width and width would be fine. I don't know what I'm doing there. 
Sorry, that was my range was weird. Let me give it that range now. Okay, one more time. Let's just see this loop go. Oh, goodbye. Come back in. Oh, that was weird. Oh, wait. Okay, hold on. Let me, let me back up for a second. Let me just do this for a second. Kind of put my finger on where it started. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, uh, that was what I was saying, the same I've, you've been recording the whole time. No, no, I know, everyone's, <laughs> sorry, this is going off the rails a little bit. Let me back up. Matthew, I'm just gonna like back up so that, um, to where I had that stroke bug, so that there's not me list like constant stopping and starting. Okay, this was the problem. Yeah, no, I did, I, I w negative width divided by two, I was gonna try to expand the range because Perl and noise like keeps around the center so much, which is why I was saying, I know that the correct range is negative width divided by two, and so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, all right, okay, hold on. All right, this weird little bug, why is there no outline in the first frame, is just because I missed something quite obvious in my code, which is that I have the stroke drawn right here. So I actually want to, let me fix this up a little bit because I kind of drew this thing in this very weird way. Let me actually draw everything relative to the center. Let me put stroke and stroke weight right at the beginning. And then the angle is always the percentage times two pi. I'm gonna get this noise value. And then what I'm gonna do is I am, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get these, I'm gonna get this is like x1, this is like x2, y2. And what I'm going to do, and I'm have this raise, I'm just gonna draw everything relative to the center now. So, and this, I'm gonna change this to n for noise, just so r isn't confusing. So I'm drawing both a circle that is moving horizontally with Perlin noise, as well as a perfectly orbiting um, line and little dot. So, and then because everything is being drawn relative to the center, I've got to change my range to negative width divided by two, width divided by two. And this should be x1, and this is x2. Okay, so now we see this. Now one thing I could do I that someone suggested to make this a little bit more uh, visually compelling. Let me just increase the stroke weight even more. And let me draw the first circle also at, at the, the, y, the y height of that orbiting thing. So this is gonna look like something of a somewhat chaotic scene, um, but it should, if I did it correctly, be a perfect GIF loop. <laughs> so let me go here, let me look in the output. I see that's the first frame, right? This is here and this is here. The last frame is that there and that there. Oh, look, it matches up. And guess what? So in my previous GIF loop coding challenge, I used a web service, I think it was easygif.com. There's another thing you can use called FFmpeg. Let me pull up the FFmpeg website. Uh, FFmpeg is a complete cross-platform solution to record, convert, stream audio and video. Now, I've already installed FFmpeg on this computer. It's a command line utility. So how to do that is something I'd be happy to come back and do in another video. But what I can do now is if I am in my console and I am in the directory, I'm in that output directory, I can say, <laughs> I wrote this, I have this in the chat here, FFmpeg, uh, the format is image two. I want a frame rate of like 30 frames per second. Um, and my, I want to make it a GIF. Uh, no, no, this is my file name. And this percent 3D is indicating that I have all my file names are named. Uh, if you look at them, they're all named 
gif dash then three digits dot png. So I can say percent three d dot gif. This is saying all of those files convert them from a image to a gif. Uh, and then I just give it the file name of the GIF I want. So I'm going to say uh, noise loop dot GIF, and I'm going to hit enter. It's going to do, <laughs> oh darn, <laughs> I got an error. What did I not, what did I not do correctly here? <laughs> okay, uh, what I did incorrectly there is the files are named .png. I'm saving PNGs out of processing, converting them to a GIF. Now I'm going to hit enter, and then I'm going to say a little GIF prayer. And it seemed to have worked. And I'm going to go now and look into that folder and all the way at the bottom or at the top or nowhere. <laughs> Where did they put it? Noise loop GIF. Oh, oh, whoa. Whoa, I'm in like temporary land? Hold on a second. Huh? Hold on. <sighs> yeah, there it is. I don't know why it was, I was, it was, I don't know what, I deleted the folder. Ah, I deleted the folder and terminal put me into there. Okay, sorry. All right. Let me do that one more time. Okay, so um, the files are named gif-theor00.png, because they're PNG files. I want to load the PNG files and turn them into a GIF. So now, if I just need to change this to .png, noise loop.gif, hit enter. Uh, <laughs> I did this already, so task for everyone over right now. No, no. <sighs> yes, Mike, hold on, hold on. We are going to fake making this seem like I never made a mistake, but I did make a mistake, but I'm correcting the mistake. Okay, here we go. All right, so the files that I saved from processing are not GIFs, they're PNGs. I'm taking the PNGs and turning them into a GIF. So here we go, PNG. Uh, now I'm going to turn that into noise loop GIF. I'm going to hit enter. It's doing it. It's doing it. Yay. It seems like it worked. Then I'm going to go back to the finder into this folder. I'm going to go down and there it is. Noise loop gif. And now we say our little noise loop prayer and watch the gif loop. Right? It's a perfect loop. I don't know, this is like not the most illustrative example again because that Y value is kind of a yeah, trick, but anyway. I don't like the fact that I gave it the Y position because then it makes it feel like it's moving in a circle. It's like, it's so funny how it's like actually following the rotating. That's just a coincidence, right? Right, if I do this again, yeah, see, I don't want it to follow it. Oh, I want that. Let me, oh, I got like a bad coincidence. Okay, hold on. Noise, we're gonna do, <laughs> we'll do this whole thing again. Oh wait, of course. 
Start on the other side. Start far away. <laughs> this might be a good one. No, don't follow it. You're too much following it. I'm going to find the perfect, there we go. There we go. That was a good one. Okay. 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 All right. One more. One more time. Forty-two is the answer. Lerp the Y. How can I make this more illustrative? Um, like giving it the Y value seems silly. I could say like height minus Y. No, 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 no. Height minus height divided by two minus Y. Is that what I mean? No. Oh, I could say negative y. Yeah. I want it to start further away. So let's do, hold on. Just give me a second here. Draw a line from start to finish from the circle. Leave trailing ghosts behind the big circle. But if I leave the trailing ghosts, then the, visual, the loop won't visually match. Lerp the derp. Needs more explosions. That's a good suggestion. All right, hold on. Okay, last try. Here I am. I kind of, I, I'm looking at. <laughs> we just like, the camera's got to go off any second now. Change the color at the beginning and the end. That's kind of a good idea. Um, that's a really good idea. The brightness. Right, I'm really, I'm on a kind of a war path here to try to, all right, hold on. All right, this, okay, I'm back. I'm not ready to render my GIF yet. I'm on a mission here, which is to try to really illustrate this point. And so I did, a, I made a couple more changes. One is I now, I'm drawing this circle that's moving chaotically at the negative Y value. So at least it's reversed. I don't want it to appear as if it's following that circle. And then I also extended the range of Perlin noise to a little bit more. So it's moving a little bit more widely. I also added a noise seed so that I know every time I run it, it's gonna run exactly the same thing. Now I got a great suggestion from the chat, which is maybe to try adding color. So another thing I can do here with this first circle maybe is have the brightness itself, maybe the alpha, be, uh, be um, that noise value. So I'm going to take the noise value and uh, map it, which is goes between 0 and 1, to between 0 and 255. So we can also, and I need one more parenthesis here, so we can also see that the color of that circle is shifting. Um, Right? The, and that's not very extreme. <laughs> I'm really torturing myself here. Uh, let's try making it RGB. Yeah, all right? So it's a subtle color change, but the color change loops perfectly. Okay? All right, I have to just give up. I have to render this GIF. You as 
People who make beautiful, interesting things with lots of creative ideas in your heads will really take this and run with it. Okay, so I'm gonna now go up here from record equals false to record equals true. I'm gonna hit run and I'm gonna let this run. It is going to do, 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 do. Oh, people are telling me size. People are telling me size. Okay, one more thing. One more thing. Let's change the size. Let's also change the size, which map that noise value of zero and one to between like 50 and 500. We're going to make that kind of extreme. And you know what I could do? Ooh, ooh you know what we could do? Ooh, this is exciting. I could actually have, oh, I have a really crazy idea. Um, this is, I'm, I'm really making this a mess, but I don't care. <laughs> I am going to uh, get other noise values uh, for the size. You can't stop me. I'm going to just get X offset and Y offset 2. I'm going to make the noise max much bigger for that. Um, so that's going to be more chaotic. Um, and then I'm going to get uh, noise 2. I'm going to get another noise value. I, uh, um, I shouldn't be allowed to do this anymore. Someone should just get, bring the, the thing that, hope that takes me off. Uh, and I'm going to say noise 2. So, uh, and then that's, so this noise 2 value is going to give me the size of this circle. And so, right, so it's going to do this, and that's way too big. <laughs> so I'm going to do between 10 and 100. So that's going to give it kind of this chaotic quality, but it's going to loop perfectly. Okay, this is it. I rendered it, and now I have all these frames. I can check and see that the first frame, it looks like this. What does the last frame look like? Oh, I'm doing 200. It looks like that. That's perfect. You can see that's right before it. So let's see if this loops perfectly. Now, the way I'm going to create my GIF, which is a little bit new, is I'm going to use a tool called FFmpeg. Uh, FFmpeg is a complete cross-platform solution to record, convert, and stream audio and video. Um, uh, how you install FFmpeg would be a topic for another video, but I have it installed on this on my computer, and you can see that I can just type in terminal commands to do things like convert this video file to this other format, and I can type in some commands for a GIF, which is, I have them written over here on my invisible computer, uh, ffmpeg uh, dash f image 2. I'm going to convert this image to, I want a frame rate of 30, uh, and then I need to give it the file names, which is GIF. All my file names are named GIF dash number 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 dot png, GIF dash and I can say there's going to be three digits, percent three D dot PNG, and I want to turn that into my noise loop dot GIF. Then I say my GIF prayer, GIF, 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 I don't know. I don't, I'm like a GIF atheist, so whatever. <laughs> that was a really pathetic prayer. It's been like I've been streaming, live streaming for like hours now. Okay, we run this. Looks like it did some stuff. So I can go back into my finder and look, there's a noise loop GIF and I can watch it. Please, please loop, please loop. Just like loop. Ah, oh, it's seamless. So this is so visually not that creative, but I think now you can hopefully take this and understand something new about Perlin Noise and how to make Perlin Noise loop and make some more perfectly looping GIFs that you can share. You can give them as gifts to the internet. Hashtag GIF train, GIF rain, train GIF. No, 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 GIF train, whatever. I'll see you later in a future video. Thank you for watching all the code and all, uh, all the uh, links to things uh, relate that I talked about in this video are all linked in the description. Mwah. See you soon. Okay. That, that is all. All right, is 12, let me just, all right, hold on. I'm gonna, um, I need, I need a, like a few minutes to sort of see like how I'm doing on time. So we're gonna take a short break uh, and I will be back in a few minutes hopefully to do um, a little bit about um, object-oriented inheritance.
As always, I always forget the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot song. This dot, this dot. This dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot. I'm gonna do this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. Turn this dot, this dot, this dot. Never forget this dot. I'm gonna do the this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot, the this dot song. Never forget the this dot. Somebody composed that song for me. Uh, just give me, I'm gonna need another like about five more minutes. I'm gonna go get some water. Sing it with me. It's the forward coordinates. The polar to Cartesian coordinates <clears throat> Auto tune and the internet will fix that for me. Sing it with me. It's the polar to Cartesian. It's the polar to Cartesian coordinate song. It's the polar to Cartesian coordinate song. It's the polar to Cartesian coordinate song.
Here's the water. Fun coding asks, where is the water? Here is the water. It's actually quite far away, but I have to walk all around to the other side of the building. Uh, okay. All right, so let's see here. It's 12.45. I really want to get to this. Um, I really want to get to this uh, other topic. But it's going to take me a minute to get there. Let's save all this stuff. Stop. Save. Um, so, <clears throat> if you're wondering what I'm about to do, I'm going to do something very ill-advised. <laughs> and uh, prototype JavaScript coding train. Uh, okay, that's perfect. Um, um, and the question is, prototype, do I have the code that I left off with here? Is it on, is it here somewhere? Mm, would it be under tutorials, P5JS, like 16? No. Here? 10? No. Where? What is this video number? Nine. Prototypes in JavaScript. Would it be here in nine? That makes no sense. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Oh, look. By the way, somebody sent me a clip that was like four seconds long, and it was a Google Drive link that was a auto-tuned Polar to Cartesian thing. But it was like five seconds long. Listen to this full song that is by, I, sh I, I forgot to give credit to this song is from Yolaxi on SoundCloud. Uh, SoundCloud, Yolaxi, Polar. All right, let me just go to SoundCloud dot com slash yolaxi. So this is where this particular song comes from. Um, and uh, um, this is here. So those people are talking about gif.js and it distracted me for a second. Um, oops, no, 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 don't do that. Um, so, ah, this is what I want. I want this code that I had before. Perfect. And let me go, I'm going to do this not in the... Hello, uh, welcome. What the? To a video. I'm going to do this not in um, So let me do the following Think does this is this the way I used to do this <laughs> prototype? Oh, I, sh I, I, I think I need to do this fresh. Probably shouldn't do this now. Uh, oh no, it's prototype G slash B. Okay.
just getting ready to do a tutorial that is ill-advised. But I kind of wanted to do it this week. Um, wait, where's that code? Did I lose it already? Let's say, here we go. Lots of room here. There we go. Um, and oh, it's broke. Something's broken here. Okay. Whatever. That's fine. I don't really care. And I need the CDN. Which I should just get from here. Okay. All right, everybody. So um, you, you might be wondering what's about to happen. I'm not really entirely sure. So uh, what I want to do is two or three video tutorials about um, object-oriented programming inheritance um, as it relates to maybe particle, uh, particle system or physics simulation design. And I was going down this road uh, apparently in, oh, we, almost exactly two years ago. Wow, two years ago to this day. Um, and I was doing it with ES5 and pro, like the prototype syntax directly. And so I think what I would like to do is um, complete this with a little follow-up video, but really go into, um, but really go into inheritance with ES6 classes. Okay, DT6 in the YouTube chat sends this link of their work. So let me quickly go to uh, twitter.com slash arts generative. I think I'm gonna have to just go to the, ah, lovely. Oh look, some nice times table stuff. Is this the one I was supposed to look at? 109.82769.109, no. <laughs> this one, this is, this is really nice stuff, it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, my Invisi laptop is a bit visible, thank you. <sighs> okay, <sighs> can I manage to do this? I, and I said I was going to do it, and I, I want to back out of that, but now that I said I'm going to do it, I'm starting to feel like the need for lunch. It's 1 o'clock. I mean, three hours is my, two hours should be my limit, and three hours is my absolute limit. So let me see if I can manage to power through a little bit longer. The hearts. The hearts? Where are the hearts?
All right, so the other thing that I need to do, this is really unfortunate, <laughs> is recreate. So I just want to, I want to find, like, what did I sort of like end up with on the whiteboard here? Some browsers that don't support. Okay. Okay. All right, I need to somewhat. Uh, first image in the 10 videos and photos. Oh, this one. Oh, yeah, I saw this one. Oh, yeah, this is amazing. I'm sorry. This is a beautiful heart image. I saw this the other day, and uh, it's so lovely. And my, my brain is melting like like this heart is melting into beautiful rainbow colors. Maybe there's a way you could apply Perlin noise and make this animated loop. Sorry for like being dense and not being able to find that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that is beautiful. Why doesn't it show up here? That's so weird. Like, oh, whoa. Whoa, and here it is animating. Oh, lovely. Whoa, oh, look at all these. So, oh wow, whoa, okay, okay, okay. I, uh, thank you so much uh, to Arts Generative on Twitter for sharing this with me. Sorry for being kind of dense and uh, not noticing. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Coding train breaking news. I think that might be too loud, long of a sound effect. There is breaking news was just submitted to the website repo. I'm being told. If I go to thecodingtrain.com under coding challenges, under uh, bouncing DVD logo, bounce, no, no, I don't see it. I don't see it. Is it not merged yet? Is it not merged? How am I supposed to find it if it's not merged? Uh, let's go to uh, website, pull requests, bouncing DVD logo, this must be it. This must be it. Uh, Bouncing video on how to create a bouncing DVD logo video. Here's the URL. I guess this will get merged soon enough. Let's go to full view. <laughs> My work here is done. I mean, I didn't make this, but thank you. Thank you to Orville Chalmer, <laughs> this is really quite phenomenal. <laughs> oh, it's gonna hit the corner, it's gonna hit the corner. Oh! Oh, it's gonna, it's gonna. Oh, shoot. <laughs> we have to wait now. <laughs> so much for that job. I mean, I could talk about JavaScript prototypes anytime, but I could. Oh! Come on. Maybe it needs like a drum. Oh, shoot, that was so close. Oh, that, that was kind of the corner, was it? That was the corner. Ah, it's really bouncing there. I think we're getting further away. Yes, we're just getting further away now. It never hits the corner because it has round corners, says Anthony. I feel like we're going to get a nice, there, okay. Oh yeah, that's close enough. All right, for hitting the DVD corner, you win a bell <laughs> and a train whistle.
We'll see you next time, where the prizes will be a cup of water. All right, back to the prototypes. <clears throat> All right, here's the, here's the bad news, everybody. I need to somehow recreate this diet, this stuff, because I like in in theory I'm. Is this the is this my good pen? So I don't need to redraw all of this, but I'm going to say P one X Y prototype. Okay. P one X Y prototype and then that goes to particle.prototype which has a show function particle.prototype which has a show function and then it has this weird underscore proto And that goes to object.prototype, which has like object.prototype. I don't even know if this is right. <laughs> I really made this two years ago? I've been doing this for that long? This is crazy. I mean, I've been doing this for much longer than that, but this YouTube video nonsense, uh, prototype. Links down to here, is that right? Yeah, and this has other things, like uh, I think I was talking, it has own property. <laughs> this is so funny, I'm continuing this video from two years ago. And then we could have like P2, which has X and Y and prototype. Okay, so this is basically the diagram I had before. Um, all right. So now what I need, now what I need, refresh this. This video, by the way, has 86,000 views, which is totally insane. This gotta have, oh yeah, this is, this is a lot of thumbs down. A lot of thumbs down. A lot of thumbs down on that one. Whoop. That's a, uh, all right, so now I just need, I need a little cheat sheet here. Um, I need a little cheat sheet, um, which is my old, olden days. Where do, where would I have one of my historical inheritance with prototype examples. But I think I've converted everything. Um, like what I'm, hold on. JavaScript prototype inheritance. Let me just see here. This looking on my invisible computer <laughs> for the way I used to do this. I guess well, I should look for it on this computer. Um, hold on, I have an idea. Mm. Oh, I know how I could do this. Nature of code. Okay. I know exactly what to do. So I'm looking at this, and then I want to go to like here, and then I have this inheritance example. And if I look at it, it's using extends. But if I go into the history of this file, ES6 updates, ES6 inheritance. 
So probably if I go to this version of the file, yeah, now how do I browse the file? View file? No, no, not that one. View file? Yep, here we go. So this is my old, okay, great. Except there's, this shouldn't be here, but that's fine. Okay, but this is what I need. Uh, I think I can actually remember this, but it'll be my reference just in case. Okay. All right, I think I'm ready for this. <laughs> ready for this very bad idea on this no good, very bad, terrible idea day. The problem with me doing this is I really should only be doing this if I'm also going to do the ES6 ones. But such is life. It'll have to wait till next week. Because I got obsessed with the noise loop thing. The water is gone. I've got 24 minutes before I turn into a pumpkin. And here we are. Hi everyone, um, I am doing something very ill-advised, I think, in this video, but I am I'm a completionist and I'm returning to something. I made a video, apparently, almost, today is February 20th, 2019, and I made this video February 22nd, 2017, almost to the day two years ago, about prototypes in JavaScript because I was on this path towards explaining a concept known as inheritance and also another concept known as polymorphism. Now I do have videos about object-oriented programming, inheritance, and polymorphism in Java with the processing development environment. You could go and watch those. And I also intend that my, what I really should be doing with my time right now is making a video about inheritance with ES6 classes in JavaScript. And that's coming, and that's the video you should go and watch. But I, I just, I can't let this go. And I, at the very end of this video, I said, and then I'll make a follow-up one about inheritance using prototypes in JavaScript, and I never did. And perhaps, perhaps there's a kernel of value here in that ES6 classes uh, is really just what's uh, referred to as like syntactic sugar, and I do have a sweet tooth, uh, um, um, over, uh, you know, truly everything, uh, JavaScript is still a, a, proto, a, a prototype-based object a language. So understanding how these prototypes work and how this concept of inheritance applies to them is perhaps useful. So if you're still with me, I'm going to try to explore inheritance with prototypes in JavaScript as a follow-up to this video 9.19 from two years ago. So if you watch that, maybe you just, maybe you literally just watched that video and somehow ended up here, which would be kind of amazing. Um, if you did, you might have seen that, that I had this diagram. And the idea of this diagram is I was trying to explain that I want to, I'm programming a particle system and there's going to be particles moving around my canvas. And I have multiple particle objects. Each of those particle objects has its own x, y position. P1 has an XY, P2 has an XY, but the functionality is tied to particle.prototype. So I've added a show function that draws the particle as part of the prototype, and there is this idea of a prototype chain, meaning that um, everything descends from object.prototype. So if we call a function or look at a property of an object, we first see if it's that object's own property, or is it somewhere up the prototype chain? So what would it mean now if what I want to do is create a new kind of object? Uh, I think in my Nature of Code book, I call it confetti, which is kind of like a random weird thing, but I'll just use that for this, because I can't think of anything else right now. Um, if I were to create an object, something called confetti, and a new prototype, a class, again, ES6 class. And the way I do this now is with ES6 classes. I don't do this anymore, but I'm, I'm just exploring it because I, I can't help myself. <laughs> confetti.prototype. What I want is I want confetti.prototype to inherit everything from particle.prototype, but maybe have its own additional function. I don't know, like maybe it has a function called burst. 
So it gets show, somehow it's gonna get show. I don't have to rewrite the show function. It's a special kind of particle um, that somehow uh, inherits that. So let's, let's see how would we do that. <laughs> okay, so coming back to the code. I don't really know how this works. I gotta, let's give this a try. Don't worry, I have my cheat sheet over here of my actual example from the Nature of Code book if I need to refer to it. All right, so let's go to the code. The idea here is, okay, I am going to write a new uh, class called confetti, but it's not a class. I'm, this is an old, old way of doing stuff with this idea of a constructor function. Because the idea here is I want to say now, uh, I'm going to have, and look, I was even using var. So I'll keep using var, because I'm living in the past today. C, and C is a new confetti. I want to be able to say like c.show, for example. I want to be able to call that function. So right now, if I were to run this code, I have this loaded here. C.show is not a function. Okay, so how do I have confetti inherit everything from particle? So I think what I do is I can say particle timeout. I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> I have to look at my cheat sheet. Particle.call, I was right, I was right, particle.call, particle.call, I knew that's what it was, I knew that's what it was, all along. I'm gonna type, so okay, so the, the first thing that I'm gonna do is in the constructor function, I'm gonna say particle.call this. Oh, this is so weird, but what the, oh, I, oh, I don't like this at all. But what this is doing is it's basically saying execute the constructor function of particle. Just do what I do when I am a particle. So let's take a look. Let's not do c.show, but let's console log p and console.log c. So we're going to look at the particle object and the confetti object now. Hit refresh. So look at this. Both particle and confetti both have an X and a Y at 99. You can see they have those properties. They both descend from object. And if we go into here, we see that particle has its own show function, and then it gets a whole bunch of other things from object. But confetti, uh, it doesn't have the show function. It just has all the things from object, okay? So how, 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 how do I link the two? Well, one way to link the two is by saying confetti, wait, hold on, <laughs> I think, by saying confetti dot prototype, wait, hold on, I have to look it up. I can't retain anything. <laughs> this is, I'm gonna edit out the me looking it up part. That's what I thought. Oh, yeah, 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 object dot create. Aha, uh aha, -huh. uh -huh. oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so one way to link the two would be to say, okay, you know what? Confetti dot prototype should be the same as particles prototype. So I want to set the confetti's prototype to particles prototype. Now this is not a good idea, I don't think, but let's just, for the sake of argument, let's put that in our code. And let me, uh, let me refresh this. And we can see, okay. Uh, oh look, the show function showed up there. Fascinating, amazing. Well, maybe we're done. We inherited the show function. Great. Oh, and look, the constructor is even the particle constructor. Perfect, all this is great. Done, finished, I'm out of here. Wait, I think there's a problem. So this is a bad idea because we actually don't want to set it equal. This could cause us problems. And what we actually want to do, all, the, the idea of prototype is to base an object off of other objects. And, it would, it, and in order to do this properly, we need to say object.create particle.prototype. We want to make sure we make a new object that is based on the particles, prototype itself, and that's what we're actually pointing to, not directly to the prototype. Okay, so let me just add that in, and I'm going to hit refresh again. Wait, no, here we are, here we are. And, ah, uh, great. 
I don't, why do I have to do that? Do I really have to do that? <laughs> Hold on. I don't actually know about this stuff. Can we just forget that prototypical inheritance uh, exists? Ooh, I see that David also made like this really cool looping GIF. Yes, I would totally use classes over prototypes. Don't do this. Wait, why do you need, um, can someone explain to me why I needed to do that? Okay, I'm looking at this. Like, where is this going to cause a problem? Like, what if, oh, I just want to see. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess I could just. I think I shouldn't make this video. <laughs> right, I wonder, if someone could explain to me why I'm supposed to do that, that would be great. Um, Okay, I see. If you do, ah, thank you, thank you. That's why. Thank you, me, I am so me. Mwah! That's totally it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So let me go back. While this looks right, I have now have a confetti object that inherits show from particle because I've tied the prototypes together. This is actually a terrible idea. So I'm going to show you in a minute why this is a terrible idea, but let's leave it this way just for a little bit longer. Why, why am I doing this in the first place? The idea is that, you, like, the idea here is that this particle prototype, this particle object, it's go, might, it, if, you're, if you're looking at some of my other examples, has a lot of stuff to it. Maybe it has this whole like, set of physics algorithms built into it, and I want to just create a new kind of object that includes all of that physics stuff, but I can just draw it in a different way. So let's just try to like simulate that for a little bit. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add now another function to particle called um, update. And what I'm going to do in that function is I'm going to say this.x plus equal, and I'm using p5 so I can use random. Negative five, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to move the x and the y around randomly. So imagine this is like a really elaborate physics simulation that I've worked out for how this particle should move. Really, I'm just moving it randomly. So now what I want to do is I'm going to now add the draw function. The draw function will loop, and I can say p.update, p.show, c.update, a c.show. And what I'll have now, and I'm going to say background zero, uh, and I'm going to just make sure I can really see this by saying stroke 255 and stroke weight 8. So I should see, if I go back to here, two little dots dancing around. One is the particle object, one is the confetti object. The wonderful thing here is my confetti object, which, sorry, I am going to now, which is now C. So I have C, a confetti object. I have P, a particle object. This links to confetti.prototype. But confetti.prototype and particle.prototype right now are equal. They're the same thing. So it's actually as if this is linking directly to particle.prototype. So the show function it's getting is right here. And there's also now an update function. OK. So my confetti object has both an update and a show function and its own x and y. The particle has its own x and y and an update and a show function. So what I want to do is I want my confetti object to inherit this update function, but I want it to have its own show function. I want it to have its own show function. I want it to draw itself in a different way, maybe as a square or with some color or something like that. So let's go back 
here. And what I'm going to do is say, like, OK, no problem. What I want to do now is say that confetti.prototype, I can type, I can type. OK, I'm going to have to copy paste that. Uh, dot prototype dot show equals function. And I'm going to just do something totally different. Um, I'm going to uh, give it a, uh, I'm going to say stroke 255, 0, 255. I'm going to say uh, fill, no fill. And I'm going to draw this as a square um, with a side length of 50. And now I'm going to hit enter. Uh, and ah, what's going on? Why, 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 why isn't the confetti calling its show function? The reason why it's not, well, okay, well, okay, well, maybe I need to do this after, after I do this. Confetti.prototype equals particle.prototype. Ah! Wait, now they're both showing like confetti. And they're both, I want them to do the same update function, but I want them to do different show functions. So why is that not working? It's because I can't actually, the way that the prototypical inheritance chain thing works is I can't set confetti prototype equal to this. I've basically overwritten it. So it's as if there, there aren't two separate ones. I want to base this on that, not overwrite it. And the way to do that, it's like kind of ridiculous, and this is why the ES6 classes methodology that you should just turn this video off and go use instead, um, is I have to say um, right here, object dot create particle prototype. It's basically making a new <laughs> prototype based on the particles prototype, but I can modify it. So once I've done that, and I hit enter, now you can see I have both of them are using the same update function, but one has its own show function. And let me show you, we're going to see this in the console in a way that hopefully will bring this all together in a way that makes sense. So look at this. They each have their own xy. That's good because that xy property is added in the constructor function, which both the particle constructor function and the confetti constructor function call. The particle object has a show and an update function as part of itself. But look at this. Now the confetti object has its own show function, but, oops, sorry. But its update function is down here because it points to the particle. So this is the chain. Confet particle is kind of has its own show and update. Confetti has an XY, its own show, but it also has a show and update which it copied from particle. Now the reason why it doesn't call this one is it always looks for the first instance of something up that prototype chain. So this is wildly confusing and convoluted. Hopefully this gives you a little background and sense of how this works. Um, but there's one other missing piece of this, I believe. Which, sorry, there's one other missing piece of this, I believe, which relates to this here. The confetti, uh, the confetti object doesn't actually have its own constructor. Really, it should. So for example, if I wanted to do something, like I'm just going to add right here, like I want to do something else, like console log, hello, this is confetti. Like in addition to initializing this object the way a particle does, I want to do something else. Actually, maybe what I want to do is give it a color. This.color equals uh, a new color that is uh, pink. And then actually what I'm doing is I'm calling that under stroke. I'm referencing the confetti has a color. Like the, the particle gets an X and a Y, the confetti gets an X and Y and a color. Let's see what happens here. Oh, weird. Weirdly, that worked. <laughs> so I thought I needed this other step, which is this confetti prototype constructor equals confetti. So is this really unnecessary? Let me just put that in here. Right, because if I go back to here, The constructor is pointing to particle. If I refresh, 
now it has the constructor, the confetti constructor, which is what I want. Huh. Well, I mean, that seems like important, but it worked anyway. Uh, don't worry, me, I am so me is typing. <laughs> what a disaster. Is it 130 yet? That's when I'm leaving. I think constructor lets you use type of correctly. So that's the, that's the issue. Or you can inherit from it. Oh, interesting. <laughs> the real CR4XY is um, recommending some other YouTube video to watch, <laughs> which I probably should have done before I started down this path. So maybe it's just the type of thing? Okay, it's a minor detail. But let's try that. Uh, C type of particle. No? Wait, how do I use type of? Oh, it returns it, not a Boolean. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's not, oh, no, no. Remember, those are functions. Ah! It's of the variable. Yeah, yeah, no, this is right. Type of C. Object, oh, thanks, that's really great. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just, it makes it uh, uh, cleaner, but there's, how do I get the um, class name? Get, um, hmm. Hmm. It's still pr inst instance of, thank you. That's what I'm looking for. Maybe that's what, um, C, P instance of particle, true. Instance of confetti, false, okay. C instance of particle, true. Confetti, also true. It's useless, <laughs> unless I didn't reload it. Hold on, let me take that out. Maybe I didn't reload it. True. Particle. True. P instance of confetti. False. No, everything is working the way it should. Let's put this in. I think this is actually completely useless. C instance of confetti. True. Particle. True. It's the same. False, particle, true. It looks like it's a BIMCB rights, which I agree with. It looks like it's somewhat of a standard with no actual meaning. Useful for if you're constructing types dynamically, but not useful otherwise. Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna mention it, but um, but So interestingly enough, this worked anyway. I thought I needed this other step in order for it to call the confetti constructor properly. Uh, here, if I'm saying um, new particle versus new confetti, it looks like it works anyway, but I'm gonna show you what this step is. Really, one thing, one thing that's kind of missing here is that in, if I look in the prototype here, the uh, particles constructor is pointed to this particle function. And if I go here into the confetti, you can see like, oh, there is no constructor. It's getting it from the prototype chain, which is incorrect. The confetti object should have its own constructor. And so a way to do that is to say, um, I think it's to say, uh, actually I have this line of code here in my, from my example. I'm just gonna copy it in. That's what, it, uh, is to say this confetti.prototype constructor equals the confetti function. 
right? I want to like specifically assign it that. And it seems to me that this is just a convention to kind of clean things up. I can't actually find a place where I need that in order for my code to run correctly, but I'm going to leave it in there. And so now I'm going to hit refresh and we can see here that a confetti object inherits everything from particle, including it gets its own X and Y, and it gets a show function. Sorry, sorry, and it gets a show and an update function. It has its own constructor and its own show function because I wanted to modify the confetti show function from the particle show function. Oh, don't worry, if none of this made any sense to you, um, that's okay. Um, this is confusing and weird, but this is underneath the hood how all of this stuff is linked together in the implementation of the JavaScript programming language itself. This is the prototype inheritance chain. I can basically create a new object with its own function, calling the other object's constructor function, and then attaching its prototype to a new object based on another object's prototype. It's really weird and kind of awful, um, but this is how I used to make my examples, but don't worry. Oh, there's a new way I make these examples. Oh, you don't have to worry about this anymore. Um, you can skip to, I haven't made it yet, but soon enough, within the next week or two, I will be uploading and publishing a video all about inheritance in JavaScript using ES6 classes. And in those videos, I really talk about the theory behind inheritance, why it's useful, and how to put it into practice in JavaScript. So if you actually made it through watching this video, thank you. Um, hopefully this uh, helped add a little something to your day. And I'll see you maybe in those ES6 classes videos. Thanks. Goodbye. Um, all right. All right. It's 1.30. I have to go. I don't know if I should release this video without having made the other ones. We'll see. Um, Nico is asking, can you please put the full live online as well for this one? So the whole live stream will stay archived as soon as I hit stop streaming. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then also edited versions will be uploaded separately. So I always leave everything online unless, you know, I guess I reserve the right to take it down if there was some big problem, but I have not yet to date taken a live stream down. And apparently this is like live stream un number 160 something. Um, so let me just check for any thank yous here. Uh, so we had, uh, looks like we had new member, Cryptic, who all <laughs> also super chatted uh, with a comment, try a coding train, try a coding train with Perlin noise looping smoke. Ooh, interesting. Uh, that would be like to loop the, th the Z axis in a way, like to do a torus basically, or a sphere or something uh, like that, to loop the Z value around back to the beginning. I've been live streaming for three hours. I don't think I'll be able to get to that today, but I do love that idea and would like to try it. Um, so thank you to everyone who joined today. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Um, maybe I could go back to a slightly happier place uh, and just open this. And this is where I'm going to finish. Why did it not work, by the way, when I go to full? Let's try this. I go to full. Test, test, test. It is, why is it not getting the audio in? There's no error in the console. So strange. What if I do present? Hello, test, test. Really weird. But if I go to sketch, oops, sketches and hit play, it gets the audio. How weird. Um, all right. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I'll be back next Wednesday. Let me check my calendar. Next Wednesday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern. I got to work on this data and APIs thing. <laughs> All of that's coming next week. Field trip, one more. I'm looking at my calendar. I see nothing. I see nothing telling me that next February 27th, there's no reason why I wouldn't be here. So next Wednesday. I mean, if I could sneak in some time, I would love to come back and do the ES6 classes inheritance stuff tomorrow or Friday or Monday or Tuesday. Pretty unlikely that's going to happen, but I certainly will come back to it next week. 
Um, and uh, George asked, Dan, will you answer questions today? Well, I, I, I would be happy to answer a few questions if they appear in the chat. Um, you need to interact with the page before you can use the audio or mic, I think. I think that's true. That is true. So how do I, so what if I, I have an idea. Let's put this in mouse pressed. So I won't start the mic until mouse pressed. And, but I think I could do this so that it's not null. Let's try this. Hello. No. Okay, so hold on. Ah. What if I do this and just say if mic? I know the camera just went off. So if I do this and then I click, it starts. And uh, um, Eitan asks, do you work at a company? So my full-time job is teaching at a program called ITP and also IMA. ITP is the graduate program. IMA is the undergraduate program at Tisch School of the Arts in New York University. Um, and that's actually where I am. I'm in the Tisch building um, in a closet where I set up some cameras and I do this. Uh, all right, let's try this. No, so weird. The, I know that that's, there's like a weird Chrome thing. All right, I'm not gonna worry about this. It's so sort of silly. Oops, sketches, I guess. I just was like, I don't know why I was, I was gonna try to put this on the screen. All right, this is my goodbye song. For reference, what time is it now? 1.38 p.m. By the way, when I went to get water, it was snowing outside in New York. I wonder if it still is. Um, according to Web Audio API po Privacy Policy in Chrome, Safari, and Firefox, usually I do audio context.state equals resume after interaction. Okay. Try the embed version and not the full one. Yeah, these are all good suggestions. All right, uh, goodbye everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I will see you next Wednesday. I'm fading myself out. Oops, no. I'm muting my microphone and I will hit stop streaming in a minute or two. Just coming back to say hi to Yolaxi. Hi Yolaxi, thank you for the uh, Polar to Cartesian coordinate song. Did you also, somebody shared with me a short clip of the Google Drive link, I don't know where it was. It was very similar to what you made, but it wasn't you, was it? Did you make an earlier version that was like a short clip? Okay, bye everybody.